Fred Gray is a preacher, a teacher, a leader, a lawyer, a trailblazer, and a civil rights champion. One of Fred Gray's clients, Martin Luther King Jr., said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But it doesn't bend by itself, and it doesn't bend easily. It bends because of the blood and sweat and courage and intellect of people like Fred Gray. And when you look at the arc of the moral universe, you will not only see Fred Gray's fingerprints, you'll see his handprints and his shoulder impression as he worked to bend that arc towards justice in order to destroy everything segregated he could find. So it's a thrill to be here with Fred. If we could go back in time just a little bit uh, and get a little bit more of an introduction to you Take us back to the, the segregated South, to Montgomery, Alabama, to your beginnings. I was born in Montgomery, Alabama on December 14, 1930. That's a pretty long time ago. Montgomery is the cradle of the Confederacy. It was known then as that and still is known as that. In recent years, it's kind of taken on a new name, and that's as the cradle of the Civil Rights Movement. We'll talk about that a little later on. But I lived in, uh, in the Washington Park section, because, you know, Washington Park was, uh, and it was, and still is, probably one of the most dilapidated and lower income areas of the city of Montgomery. We had no paved streets, we had no running water, and it was some time later before we had lights. I was the, I am the youngest of five children. My father died when I was two, and my mother had little or no education other than a fifth or sixth grade. However, she told us, as I recall, and I don't even remember my father, she was a very religious person and she was a very conscientious person. But she told us we could be anything we wanted to be if, I did, if we did three things. One, kept Christ first in our lives. Two, stay in school and get a good education and three, stay out of trouble. Don't get involved in this criminal justice system. I later found out what she meant because the criminal justice system does not always result in justice. I tried to do that and I tried to instill that in my, in my children and grandchildren's mind. But early on, she would take me to church. She would take all of us to church. And uh, as we grew, as I grew up in the early, uh, in 30s and 40s, and even in the 50s in Montgomery, I really, we lived in two worlds, and I lived in one world. My world basically was a black community. I didn't know any white people, I knew no white children, knew no white adults, and the only white person I really knew during my first eight or 10 years was the lady my mother worked for. Her name was Betty Aldrich. And at the time I was born, I was, she was working for her. My mother named me, at least at the time, and I tell you this because it kind of tells you the, the type of life we had then. My mother and her sister were expecting children at the same time. So they decided they were going to name each other's child. My mother named my Aunt Julia's child Maxine, and my Aunt Julia named me Fred Lee after her husband, who was Fred Lee Johnson. 
When my mother went back to work and told Miss Betty what her boy's name was, she said, Nancy, I think you ought to name him David. And you know what my mother did? My mother officially changed my middle name from Lee to David. So when you see the D in my name, it's because Miss Betty Aldrich gave it. I tell you that because while I lived in a world entirely dealing with black people, at the same time, there was a tremendous amount of respect that black people had for people that they worked for. Go forward. There were only about two professions as I grew up that I remember that black boys my age could look forward to. And that was either be a preacher or a teacher. And if you did either one, you had to do it on a segregated basis because everything then was segregated based on race, and it was main day, main, it was directed by law. So that's the way it started. We then had a preacher who was from Nashville, Tennessee. We had a little church, the Hope Street Church of Christ, right in the heart of the black community. And they say I used to baptize cats and dogs and anything I could find. <laughs> so he decided that I ought to be a preacher, and my mother wanted me to be a preacher. He said, well, the Church of Christ have a little black school up in Nashville where they get boys to learn, teach them how to preach. You ought to go there. My mother didn't have enough money, but she sent me there. And our preacher took us. I apparently did pretty good as a preacher because when we got a president decided that his role was to end up recruiting students and raising money for this little school, he would take boy preachers along with him. And I was one of those boy preachers that Marshall Keeble took with me. And we went throughout the Southeast raising money for the National Christian Institute. I finished high school a little bit early. I knew a little something about preaching because Brother Keeble had taught me about it. So um, I, was a, I went to summer school one summer and was going to finish early. I was scheduled to finish in 1948. But Alabama State College for Negroes, and that's what it was called then, it's now Alabama State University in Montgomery, was on the quarter system. That second quarter started after Thanksgiving on December 1st. And I applied and got accepted subject to being a graduate of a high school. Talked to my principal. He said, if your teachers give you the exam and if you pass, we'll let you go. We did it. So on December the 1st, 1955, I ended up enrolling in Alabama State College for Negroes. I am now ready to learn how to be a teacher now that I knew a little something about preaching. That's the background up through my high school age. And it gets us to a point where I live on the west side of town. Alabama State's on the east side of town. Black people in those days didn't have as many automobiles as they have now. And we had to use the bus transportation system. I got a little job working for the newspaper company and I used those buses from as little as twice a day to as much as eight times a day. And I, as I rode the buses, I saw our people were being mistreated on buses. And it was because of the way they were being mistreated and one person even had been killed as a result of an altercation with a bus driver on the bus. I recognized that everything was completely segregated. And while I was interested in saving, seeing that persons' souls were ultimately saved, I thought that they ought to, black people in particular, 
ought to be able to enjoy some of these enjoyments now. And people, I didn't know anything about lawyers, but I thought we were being mistreated on the buses, and I concluded that if lawyers help people, and that's what they told me they did, I said, well, I want to be a lawyer. There was a man in Montgomery named E.D. Nixon, who was Mr. Civil Rights. His wife was a member of the same church that I was a member of. He was a Pullman car porter by profession, but he was also a member of and had been the president of the NAACP, the Montgomery branch and the State Conference of Branches. And any time black people had a problem with a white person, they would usually see E.D. Nixon. He was always looking for lawyers, and he encouraged me to become a lawyer. He said, I'm always trying to help out people. So I made a commitment while I was a student at Alabama State. And the good thing about part of this commitment, I kept it secret for 40 years. And that commitment was I was going to finish Alabama State. I was going to go to somebody's law school somewhere. I wasn't going to apply to the University of Alabama because I knew they wouldn't accept me and I didn't want to create any problems. I was going to finish law school. I was going to come back, take the Alabama bar exam, even though then, if you finished the University of Alabama law school, you would meet it on motion, and you didn't have to take the bar, but I was willing to take the bar exam. And I was going to, I told myself I was going to pass the bar exam, become a lawyer, and destroy everything segregated I could find. And that's what I tried to do. That's a long story, and I'm sorry. That, that, that's a wonderful story, and thank you for giving us that history, because that brings us to my next question. Uh, and it is that in the early, uh, basically mid-1950s now, you returned to Montgomery, Alabama. You've graduated from law school. You've taken two bar examinations in one summer and passed them both. And the names that we now know as icons, Rosa Parks, Claudette Colvin, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, <clears throat> they come into your life and into your path. Now, you are a young, young lawyer in Montgomery, Alabama. Can you talk to us about, about that time and the Montgomery bus problem that uh, yes, I can. The, uh, I have been fortunate enough to have represented those persons and, and others. And with a lot of help along the way, we've been able to change conditions from the conditions that I had described to you earlier. But my first civil rights case was not Mrs. Rosa Parks was not the Montgomery bus boycott, not Dr. Martin Luther King, not John Lewis, but it was a 15-year-old girl named Claudette Calvin. Claudette Calvin was a high school student at Booker T. Washington High School in Montgomery. She didn't live on the west side of town where I live, where most of the black people in Montgomery live. She lived in the northeast section of town uh, called King Hill and was only about three streets up there that black people lived in and they were surrounded by white people. So in order to get in and out of where they lived, they had to go through a white community to get to the little black community. But they had to ride the public transportation system from King Hill, downtown, then go to Booker T. Washington High School on the east side of town. And that's what all those kids did from the time they were in elementary school till they finished high school. They knew that was an unwritten rule that the first 10 seats uh, were reserved for white people. 
So we didn't sit there whether the white people came or not. She sat on March the 2nd, 1955. This was nine months before Rosa Parks did what she did. She was coming from school one day and sat in a seat, not in the first 10, but one of the other seats. But that day, more white people got on the bus than usual. And one reason that happened is because school let out early, because the teachers were having a meeting, they let the students go, so these kids got out of school several hours before they usually get out of school, and the bus they got on was not the usual bus they got on, but a bus earlier, and there were more white people on that bus than usual. But the black kids were on first, they had seated, were seated in these seats, and when white people came in, the bus driver asked the first four kids who were students if they would get up and give their seats to a white person. Three of them got up, and one didn't. Claudette Carvin did not get up. She sat in her seat. The driver asked her to get up. She says, I'm not in the white section. I paid my fare just like they paid theirs. I have a constitutional right to sit here, and I'm not going to get up. He asked her again. She remained seated. He called the police. She was arrested, and of course, once she got arrested, she did like any teenager would do when they get in trouble. She called her parents. They arranged to get her out of jail, and then they didn't know anything about Fred Gray, but she had done this, and they wanted to support her. They knew E.D. Nixon. E.D. Nixon, they called him, he called me, he recommended me to them, and they retained me to represent Claudette Carvin. Claudette had been arrested and charged with being a delinquent and was tried in the juvenile court of Montgomery County. Judge Hill was the judge of the juvenile court. They charged her with being a delinquent. Well, I knew then that I needed to prepare some documents, at least a document that would let the court know that she's not a delinquent. What they're trying to do is to enforce the segregation laws of the city of Montgomery in the state of Alabama, and that those laws are unconstitutional Based on, Brown, based on Brown versus the Board of Education, which had just been decided a year ago while it was dealing with education, if, it has, if, if separation of the races has no place in education, certainly it has no place in a bus transportation case. I filed my little motion. Judge Hill listened to it, and of course he overruled it found Claudette to be a delinquent and placed her on unsupervised probation. Now what that meant was that she wasn't going to have to do anything. But he was not willing at that early stage to do anything other than that. Joanne Robinson, another person that you need to know about on this whole thing, was a teacher at Alabama State. She taught English. In 1948, she had had a bad experience on the bus. This is several years before, on an almost empty bus. But this was a mean bus driver, and he wanted her to sit farther in the back of the bus than she was already sitting. And she just got upset, got off of the bus. 
But now, in 1955, she is president of a women's group called the Women's Political Council. Black women, most of them worked at Alabama State. They were all doing everything they could to improve the living condition of African Americans, particularly uh, children and teenagers. And she began to keep records of people who were having problems. I knew her when I was in college at Alabama State, along with uh, Mr. J. E. Pierce, who was a professor there, who had also encouraged, he was a professor of political science, and he had encouraged me to become a lawyer when I was a state. Claudette, when Claudette was arrested, Joanne decided that she would have a meeting, call a meeting with black leaders, with the bus company officials, the city officials, about Claudette's case. And we met. I met with them, and so did me, and so did Mr. Rufus Lewis, and, and uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lewis, along uh, with uh, E.D. Nixon. So what we ended up doing, they concluded, as a result of that meeting, they told Joanne and told those of us who were there that we're sorry about what happened to Claudette that it won't happen again. I was prepared at that time when Judge Hill found her to be a delinquent, and I recommended to our little group that they permit me to file a lawsuit. But the community wasn't quite ready. But what Joanne Robinson did and the Women's Political Council, they continued to keep a record of what had taken place. And they were prepared, and so was I, if they wanted me to do it, that whenever the next opportunity presented itself, we would end up being ready to do whatever it took in order to stop the situation on the buses. Now. Now, you're going to give me the Rosa Parks, right? Rosa Parks. And, and here, and here, in the meantime, I knew Rosa Parks. <laughs> <laughs> you Rosa Parks lived, she was, she was the uh, secretary of the branch of the YLCA. She was also the youth director. And Claudette Carvin had gone to some of her youth activity classes. And between the time I started practicing law up until December 1st, she worked in the department store, one and a half blocks from where I, I, my office was located. We would have lunch every day, and we talked about the problems, and we talked about what people should do. She was well prepared that if the opportunity presented itself, she would know what to do. We had a, a, one of our meetings that day on December 1st. She knew that I was going to be out of town that evening. But when I got back from out of town, Mrs. Parks had been arrested. I had a call from Mrs. Parks. She asked me to come over to her house and told me what the situation was. And that was the beginning of the plans for the Montgomery bus boycott that started the Civil Rights Movement. You know, Fred, the thing that is that is fascinating to me, we know the history from, from books, primarily. And as recently as a month or so ago, the New York Times wrote an article uh, that documents from Rosa Parks' arrest and her warrant for her arrest were found in the basement of some courthouse. Uh, in, in Montgomery. So, but the thing that, that fascinates me is that you were going to take this case, this single case of this single individual who had been so mistreated, representing a community that had been mistreated, but you had the vision to see ahead to what lawyers could do with this. Talk to us about sort of the case with Rosa Parks and then Browder and how the legal strategy sort of plays out. Uh, 
when Mrs. Fox <coughs> invited me to her house after she was arrested on December 1st, I went and we talked. This was on a Thursday. Uh, she told me that he had charged her uh, uh, with disorderly conduct, and she had not been disorderly, and of course I knew Miss Fox had not. I knew she was going to do just what we had talked about earlier. Uh, she said that her case was set to be tried 8.30 Monday morning. That was a short period of time. And she wanted me to represent her. I said, Ms. Parks, I'd be glad to do it. I said, but don't you worry about your case. I will do that. But I want you to know, as you know, Joanne Robinson has been talking about getting the community involved so that it won't be just you or just whoever else that happens to get arrested, but the whole black community, because this problem is larger than just, just you. So I say, don't worry about your case. I'm going to talk to uh, a man again, Mr. Uh, E.D. Nixon, who had gotten out of jail, and we're going to see if we can't get the community involved. She said, well, whatever you all decide to do, I'll be a good client. I said, fine. I left her house and went to E.D. Nixon's house. E.D. Nixon is Mr. Civil Rights. He is a Pullman car porter. He's a person who, he doesn't, he doesn't do a lot of detailed planning, but he's an action person. I reminded him of what Joanne Robinson had done and what she, and that she wanted people to stay off of the bus Monday as a protest so that the whole community would know. He says, well, if you all get it together, I'll support it. I said, well, I'm going to leave your house, and I'm going to Joanne Robinson's house. I left Mr. Nixon's house. He lived on the, on, the, on the west side of town, the same side I, I lived on, and where Miss Parks, to go to the east side of town where Joanne Robinson lived. I talked to Miss Robinson. We talked in her living room, and she said, to begin with, I said, one, Ms. Parks has retained me to represent her on the case, so don't worry about the case. I know what I'm going to do with that, and I had that under control. She said, well, what I think we need to do is we need to try to keep the black people off of the buses on Monday as a protest. Well, I said, do you want them to go back after Monday? She said, no, but we can't tell them that. She said, what I want us to do, though, I said, if that's the case, if you want them to stay off Monday and then want them to stay off longer, then we're going to have to make more than just a plan for Monday. We're going to have to make some plans for these people to be able to get to work. So we said, well, what do we need to do? We said, number one, we need to get the message out. She said, well, as soon as we get through with our conference here, I'm going to write a leaflet get it run off, and get it prepared to be distributed over the weekend. Then on Sundays, the black preachers in Montgomery have more people than anybody else. We need to be able to get these leaflets to them on Sunday morning and get them to make an announcement. But well, we knew the chairman or the president of the ministerial allowance, so we'll get hold to him. Then in addition to that, we're going to need somebody to serve as a spokesman because somebody's going to want to be able to be speaking for the group. Everybody can't speak. We had two leaders in Montgomery, two black leaders. You had E.D. Nixon. I've told you about him. You had Rufus Lewis. Rufus Lewis was a retired. He had been a coach at Alabama State. He was interested in only one aspect of civil rights, voter registration, and when people are elected, having them held accountable to do a good job in office. I said, well, and we wanted, and both of those people had leaders. E.D. Nixon had larger leaders, larger group of leaders. We were afraid if either one of those persons would be selected, 
we would lose the support of the others. Joanne said, well, I'll tell you who we need to get. We need to get my pastor, Martin Luther King, Jr. He's a young man, never been involved in civil rights activities, just been here for a little less than a year. But one thing he can do, he can move people with words. I said, well, that's good. Let's see that he gets to be selected the spokesman. I said, well, I have some suggestions for these other two. I said, well, on E.D. Nixon, and I know him. He's our, a family friend. He is a friend of A. Philip Randolph, the black labor leader in New York, who's chairman of his Pullman Carpetos. If we make him treasurer, he will end up helping him raise some money, and that will be able to help the people stay off of the buses. She said, that's fine. What we gonna do with Rufus Lewis? There's so much you can do with voter registration. But Rufus Lewis' wife, and thank God for wives. <laughs> she was co-owner of the largest fuel home in town. Guess what fuel home had? Automobiles, large automobiles. Most of them were Cadillacs. They can May, and those cars are only used when they have funerals. If we make him chairman of the transportation committee, she can get them to end up helping to transport these people to where we want to go. Then you only have one other thing. Somewhere along the way, you're going to need a lawyer. <laughs> Here am I. See me. <laughs> those are the plans. Only thing about the plans was Joanne Robinson couldn't be the spokesman and leader out there advocating it because she worked for Alabama State and she would have been immediately fired. And if it had come out that I was advocating this, they would be saying I was stirring up litigation. And before I was barred good, I would have been disbarred. So we decided that with certain people, we had to be sure that we selected or we contacted to do certain things, planted the seed, let them plant it and see what happened. When the official meeting took place, Dr. King was selected to be the spokesman at a part of the meeting before he arrived. <laughs> E.D. Nixon was selected to be the treasurer. Rufus Lewis was selected to be the chairman of the Transportation Committee, and the young lawyer just out of law school was elected to be the, 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 the coordinate the legal activities, and the rest of it is history. Well, and, and, and thank you. When the meeting would call after Mrs. Park's arrest, it didn't take but 20 minutes for it. I knew they were gonna uh, find a guilty. I raised a constitutional question. We appealed the case. We had the meeting at Dexter Avenue. Uh, uh, that was a planning session at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church on that Friday evening. The mass meeting, black people stayed off of the buses during the day that the trial took place. When we had the mass meeting at Hope Street Baptist Church that night, there were over 5,000 people. They couldn't get in the, into the church. And when Joanne and I sat there and listened to Dr. King make that speech that everybody reads about now, we conclude that what we did was the right thing and the rest is history. The rest is history and much of it is recounted in your book, Bus Ride to Justice. And if you have not, if you think this is a treat, uh, you should read the book. Uh, and they are available here, and, and if we run out of copies, Fred, they'll be available after, after we leave here. Yeah. You know, Fred, I, I want to, I, I, the, the bus protest, the bus boycott lasted over 380 days, and we know how some of that worked out. I want to talk to you about, about you for a minute, um, because leadership not only takes collaboration with local uh, 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 public officials and stakeholders and, and national organizations like the NAACP and others that you, you collaborated with, but it takes courage. 
And frankly, when you were handling this case, this, the Rosa Parks case and the Browder case and, and these cases in the middle of the 1950s as a 26-year-old lawyer, it took courage. 23 to when I started. Well, <laughs> and 24 <laughs> at that time. Okay. It, it took courage. And I, I just want you to take a minute or two and tell the ladies and gentlemen, you know, what types of, of challenges you were facing. Well, what happened to me was very simple. I saw a problem that we had in Montgomery on the buses. And I knew Mr. Nixon was doing what he could do. I saw Mrs. Parks and the NACP was doing what they could do. And I heard that lawyers help people. And so I decided that that would be the best thing for me. So when they decided to select me to be the lawyer, I was very, very happy about that. But at the same time, I had enough sense to know that being just out of law school for a little better than a year, I would be no match for the lawyers that the state of Alabama and the city of Montgomery would have in connection with the bus boycott. So the first thing I did after they selected me was to say, now where can I get some help? So I had enough sense to talk to Mr. Nixon who had been had contact with the NAACP. I got the phone number for Thurgood Marshall, got him on the phone, told him who it was. They had been reading about what was going on in Montgomery and asked him, told him that I think we're going to help. We have a lot of legal work going on. I don't know what all. I know we need to file a lawsuit. I'd like to bring you a copy of a draft of a complaint that could be used. But will you and your staff permit me to come up and talk to you? So I had enough sense to do that. And Mr. Marshall said yes. And I went up, talked to him. He assigned Robert Carter, who later became a United States District Judge in Manhattan. And that was the beginning of a relationship with the NAACP and later the NAACP Legal Defense Fund that has remained from the third week in December to date. So I recognize that while leadership is there, we weren't concerned about starting a movement. We were concerned about solving that problem. And we had a lot of problems, because the first problem was to get Mrs. Rosa Parks exonerated. The city of Montgomery versus Rosa Parks, even if we had won that case, all it would have done was found her not guilty. And the books and the state statutes and city ordinances would have been still on the books. So we had to also file the lawsuit of Browder versus Gale. That was not filed until February the 2nd, 1956. And once we did that, then that got in motion a whole series of events that continued to build and build. But the legal problems were just the beginning because four months later, John Patterson, who was then the governor of Alabama, filed a lawsuit against the NAACP because they thought that the NAACP was behind the whole bus boycott, which was not true, but they did it, and then for the next four or five years, Father, uh, I had asked the NAACP to help me with Browder versus Gale and the bus boycott. When they filed the lawsuit in June of 1956, then they asked me to help them with the NAACP. So I think a part of leadership is to recognize when you need help to have help and work with others in order to solve the problems because these problems are too great for anyone to try to solve by themselves. Well, Fred, let's, let's change gears just a little bit uh, because you've brought us to the leadership topic and you have been a leader in the National Bar Association. 
Uh, you have been a leader in the Alabama State Bar Association. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about some of your work in the last 20 or so years um, to this audience of bar leaders. When you were barred in Alabama, uh, the, the history of, of many states uh, and bar associations is not one that we're terribly proud of in 2018. And, and so when you came to the bar in, in the mid-1950s, you couldn't attend events at the bar association that you came to lead some 50 years later. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, when you, you came to be president of the Alabama State Bar, some of the, the things that were close to your heart, things that you wanted to work on so we can talk about going forward what there is for bar leaders to do. The last thing that was in my mind would have been to even thought about ever becoming president of the Alabama State Bar Association. I found out some years later that the first complaint that was filed against me was three days after we tried Rosa Parks' case. And it was filed by a person who ended up being quite a statesman later on. You see, when we did the appeal bond, uh, Mr. Nixon was the, the person who initially signed it, but I think I either signed it or had something to do with that appeal. And this great lawyer up in North Alabama filed a complaint with the bar and said that I had participated in the appeal. So it was the first complaint. Now, I had admired the Bar Association. They never told me about that. Now, the only way I found out was years later when they were doing away with all the records. And if you wanted your file, you could get it. I was told, and I got my file, and I looked through it and found here was a complaint against this person who I had later when I was president of the state bar appointed to be one of the persons to work on diversity. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, a, 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 a white lawyer up in <laughs> You never know where your help's coming from, do you? You don't know where your help is coming from. And Attorney Smith, a female lawyer up in Birmingham, was a person who initially mentioned something about me being president of the State Bar. The State Bar was meeting in Birmingham, and I got uh, out of my car, and it just happened that I saw this lawyer she uh, had gotten us to do some work. She was working for a big firm in Birmingham there doing defense work. And uh, she said, Fred, you need to be president of the Alabama State Bar Association. I said, what? She said, you need to be president of the Alabama State Bar Association. I said, well, you know, the Bar Association is the one that's been behind a lot of this business, including some complaints that I had to fight. I had to get lawyers, and I had enough sense that every time a complaint was filed against me to get a good law firm to defend me in it, and everything worked out all right. But she said, well, I, I still think you need to be president. I said, what you do? I hadn't even checked in the hotel. She said, well, we'll wait. I'm going to take you and introduce you to some people in Birmingham. She took me, introduced me to all these people, and she was telling all these folks about, I need to be president of the state ball. And I just listened to her and, and went ahead. Then later on, I saw <clears throat> the there was some interest that was building up about my being president. But there was one thing I knew. If I decided to run for president-elect of the Alabama State Ball, 
And if another lawyer decided that he wanted to run against me or she, with all these cases I had filed in desegregating schools and voting registration and almost everything else, that would simply be asking to place my neck on the noose, and I wasn't going to do it. So I talked with the, the powers that be at the bar, and I said, look, if you all think that I could make a good bar president, I'm willing to do it, but I don't need to go and voluntarily put my head out here and get it cut off. The only way I'll do it is if I can run uncontested. I said, now, in order to do that, you all will tell me when to run, because you know who's running when and what to do, and I'll follow your instructions on it. Believe it or not, they suggested some things. And guess what I did? I followed those suggestions. And it ended up, and the process we had then, and I think it is now, you just have to have a petition with a certain number of lawyers on it. It has to be filed by a certain time. And I filed it and then forgot about it. I got a phone call from Keith Norman, who was a longtime executive director. At about 5.15 one afternoon, he said, Fred, I just want to congratulate you on being president elect designee. I said, what do you mean? He said, your application for president elect was the only one filed. The time has passed, and you are now president elect designee. That's how I ended up getting to be there. But like it was when I got to be the, the, the lawyer for the Montgomery bus boycott, I said, now that I, I'm president-elect, what am I going to do with it? So I began to immediately work on that. And whenever you want me, I'll talk about that part of it. Well, I, I, think, we're, I think we're there, Fred, because okay. I, know, I know lawyers, um, <laughs> lawyers rendering service was the core My, theme of your presidency. And if you could talk to us about that for just okay. a minute. Uh, I didn't know very many lawyers. So unlike the average person who had who would run for president. So I had to, I wanted a chance to know, I wanted to do things. One, I had thought about lawyers as being persons who really had great reputations. But I found in recent years there had been some lawyers didn't have quite the reputation they used to. So I wanted to have a theme and I wanted that theme to say something for lawyers. So I concluded during my bar year, I would work on a theme. And during the course of the year, I talked to Keith Norman and have him to uh, set up meetings where these bar leaders from across the state could come to the state office, because we run a lot of services, a lot of them don't know it, so invite them down. While they're there, I'll tell them what my plans are for next year. So I made some detailed plans for our president-elect as to what I wanted to do during my bar year. So when I went in, everybody would know what I had in mind. And one was to have a theme, and the theme was lawyers run to service. And of course, we run the service to the client, to the community, and to the profession. I wanted to out that my bar year, when we do our CLEs or anything else, let's place emphasis on lawyers rendering service. That was one thing. That was another thing I wanted to do.
I was a member of the Board of Bar Commissioners. I was the first African American elected. And we had 60 members, and they were elected by the judicial circuits. But there had only been, I think, three or four of us, and only one at a time out of the 60. So one out of 60 doesn't give you much leverage. So I, I recognize that what I had done in the field of civil rights is what brought me to the bar, and I wasn't going to go away from that. And I felt that I needed to appoint a task force on diversity to recommend to the legislature to pass some legislation that would add additional members to the Board of Commissioners. And I appointed such a task force to do that. And then the third thing I wanted to do when I was president of the Alabama of the National Bar Association, and I just left there last yesterday from New Orleans, their annual meeting to come here. In 1985, I had seen these black lawyers all over the country who were doing a tremendous job, but nobody knew anything about them. And my mentor was Arthur Shores, a black lawyer in Birmingham. And I appointed a task force of the National Bar Association to look into the feasibility of establishing the National Bar Association Lawyers Hall of Fame. They did it. And in 1986, when I became president of the National Bar Association in Denver, Colorado, we installed our first members in the National Bar Association Lawyers Hall of Fame. And it became such an integral part from that time until today and on yesterday, they installed new members, including my longtime partner, Ernestine Sapp. And they usually invite me at the NBA meeting to hear the occasion and it was at noon yesterday, and I was in route up here, so I had to do a video for them down there. But when I became president of NBA, of, of, of the Alabama Bar Association, I appointed a task force for the purpose of creating an Alabama Lawyers Hall of Fame. And guess what? The Board of Bar Commissioners agreed. And beginning in 2004, the first five persons were installed in the Alabama State Lawyers Bar Association. Now on, on uh, Law Day, they have a ceremony. They have the pictures of these people, these persons hung at the Supreme Court building in Alabama. So I was able, with a lot of help, I didn't get everything I want, some of the things I wanted in the Alabama Lawyers Hall of Fame to have been included in it, I couldn't get it in. But you have to be able to accept as much as you can. But the next year, when Bill Clark was president of the Alabama State Bar Association, everybody asked Bill, said, uh, what's, your, what's going to be your theme this year? He said, I'm not going to have a theme. He said, what I am going to do, I'm going to recommend to the Alabama Board of Bar Commissioners that the Alabama State Bar establish a motto. And you know what that motto is? Lawyers render service. Now, people don't know where it came from, but when you get a letter now, <laughs> it's there. So the three things I was able to do that I wanted to do for the Alabama State Bar Association that I was able to do was one, increase diversity, two, to have the Alabama State Lawyers Hall of Fame, and what was the third one? Increase diversity on the commission. And decrease diversity. And I think 
and moves to those things as lawyers come in now. Uh, the other thing now, most of the lawyers who come in spend their elect, year elect really making plans. And I think I did, and I had to do it in order to, to be able to do it. But I hope what I've been able to do was to kind of set an example to show that the people have an opportunity, regardless of their race, regardless of their creed, regardless of their sex, if they're given an opportunity to serve, give them an opportunity to do it, and you may be surprised what happens. You, you know, Fred, there's so much I want to ask you. Um, and there's so much unfinished business. Um, you began to destroy everything segregated you could find 60 years ago. We look at our country now, segregation is still an issue for us. Racism is still an issue for us. There's so much unfinished business. I, I wonder whether you have some thoughts as we, as we conclude. We, we're really coming to the end. It's probably not fair to ask you that question as we're coming to the end, but, but if you have some thoughts you might share just for a minute or so on for these bar leaders, where they might go, uh, if, if, if you were in their shoes, what would you be doing? Well, I'm the first person to admit that we have made a tremendous amount of progress from where we started from. When the law all the laws in the southern states and a lot of other states impose segregation upon us. We have been able now through the courts primarily and through appropriate legislation to change those conditions so that the, the requirements of segregation and the requirements of discrimination has been done away with. But I have been really disheartened, even in my own state of Alabama. I thought at one time that if people saw where black people could serve and serve effectively in all of these various positions if given an opportunity, that they would open up their hearts and do it. But when I look at the ads that were on our televisions for our primaries that just ended in Alabama, basically our state, unfortunately, and many other states have only done what the federal courts have required them to do. And we now have federal courts that may not be requiring them to do very much more. So what I'm saying is that we haven't been able, people should be able to do things because it's the right thing to do. And that has not taken place. So what I'm saying is we still have, and you look at this audience and see how much diversity we have. If you want to see uh, whether or not we have been very effective diversity-wise between us, let me suggest you do a couple of things. Look at your place of worship. Look at your place of employment. Look at your sororities or your fraternities and all, and see if all of those people in those groups almost look just like you racially you may have a problem with lack of diversity. Now, one other thing that I think is important is you. While we have made progress, look at the report that the National Urban League makes every year on the status of black America. They end up dividing and saying you can measure the disparity between the majority and African Americans in five areas. Economics, health, education, social justice, civic engagements. In each, 
there is substantial disparity having a negative effect on African Americans as compared to white Americans. The report also states that African Americans are twice as likely as whites to be unemployed, three times more likely than whites to live in poverty, and more than 16 times as likely to be incarcerated. What I'm saying to us, and this country has never been able to really face up to the fact that racism still is, to, is considered too much in many things, and we don't, we just, we just do it because it's the way we've been doing it all the time. And what I usually tell people as I have an opportunity to talk to you as I'm talking to you now, think seriously about this race issue. You don't have to tell your neighbor now, but think about it. And I believe if you are objective, you will admit that racism to some degree is still in existence in this country, and this country has never really taken a real complete effort toward trying to do away with racism. First of all, if we have to solve the problems that we still have, one, we need to re realize that racism still is there and is wrong. And those of us from our, uh, from the White House to the Congress, to the Supreme Court, to the heads of these CEOs of corporations, to the heads of our Bar Association, we need to express to people that racism is wrong because some people think that it's all right. And as long as we don't see it as being a problem, we won't have it solved. During the movement, we recognized we had a problem. We were willing to do whatever it took to try to solve that problem. Secondly, just having the problem and identifying it isn't enough you're going to have to come up with a plan. That's what Joanne Robinson and I did and was able to get others to do that resulted in the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. Once you have a plan, a plan is no good unless you do what? Unless you implement it. So you've got to be willing to implement it. Every one of us, I think most of us, would, would admit that racism is wrong. And all of us would wish that it would all overnight just be done away with. But you know what? It's not going to go away that way. If it's going to go away, the last point is each one of us is going to have to become involved and do what we can to help solve the problems in our communities. And when we do that, it will help our bar association, it will help our communities, it will help everything, and it will help us all enjoy all of the rights and privileges that our Constitution provides. Uh, Fred, uh, John Lewis said it very well in introducing your book. He said, men and women of the bar, fighting the good and important fight, secured our civil liberties, our civil rights, and our freedom. Without them, the world would be a different place. I deeply feel that Fred Gray and others like him fulfilled a role in the legal phase of the civil rights movement as critical as the role Dr. King fulfilled in the mass movement phase. Thank you. Let me mention one other thing. Just, just, just a second, Fred. Because I, 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 I do, we do, I, I, so I could talk to you all day, believe me. But, but we, do, we do have to conclude, Fred, uh, on behalf of the National Conference of Bar Presidents, the National Association of Bar Executives, and our sponsor, uh, Power, Rogers, and Smith, and our co-sponsors, the ABA Commission on Disability Rights and, and the ABA Commission on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. Let, let me say thank you on behalf of, of all of us. Thank you. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, 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 I wasn't. I, 
This is well deserved. I wasn't quite done, though, <laughs> demonstrating that I've walked on my applause line. Uh, you know, yesterday I was filmed for NCVP, and they asked me what my favorite moment at NCVP was. And I've been involved in NCVP for 20 years, and I said, I think it'll happen tomorrow. I get a chance to interview Fred Gray. If it hadn't been for you taking the case of the woman on the bus and following it through to its conclusion, there wouldn't have been any young black lawyers in law school in the 1970s and 1980s who get to do what I do today. So I stand on your shoulders. Personally, I thank you. And we really appreciate this. My benediction to you and Carol is that God continue to bless you as he has all these days for all the rest of your life. Thank you.